Hi. Well, I just want to say thank you for the in invitation to come and speak today. It's a, it's a great uh, joy to be with you and a challenge. Uh, my role is in the Community Mobilization Division of UNAIDS, and so my presentation is going to be a bit different. It's not going to be about the actual clinical treatment, but it's, it's an intersection of of how to engage communities in both the service delivery but also in some of that advocacy and policy lobbying. And we're at the process at the moment of learning from the MDGs but also moving into the post-2015 development agenda and seeing what we've learned from the MDG process and from that very complex environment that uh, James has just outlined to us in terms of moving into the post-2015 agenda, what can we learn from the lessons of the AIDS response so that we can then feed into that process, but also that maybe some of these other communities who are working on non-communicable diseases and neglected tropical diseases can learn from. Um, I just want to say that this is a combination of two whole PowerPoint presentations of about 20 slides each, so I'm not going to do any of it justice. But the idea was to try and keep it at more of a top level and weave some of these strands together. So inevitably, I'm going to miss things out, but I hope by giving you some little snapshots, we can maybe pull some of it together in the discussion at the end. But I wanted to look a little bit about how AIDS has changed the way we do public health. And ha what, what of this work is transferable to other fields? What are some of the big unanswered questions um, that we have in AIDS and the challenges that we still face in, in moving towards post-2015? And how has the HIV response highlighted some of the really complex intersections between health, human rights, sexuality, religion, theology, and public health and also patent law. So there's just a whole lot of things that intersect in the AIDS response, which aren't there when you look at, at some of the other classical infectious diseases, for example. And I think some of the things we're struggling with in the AIDS response are actually the fact that that is such a multi-complex environment. Now, which, what do I push here? Okay, next one, enter. There we go, okay, cool. <laughs> I have to say, I started my life with the 16 years in the hills of Nepal with no electricity, so that's why I'm useless with technology. Um, so the AIDS response, I think, I mean, th I'm telling you things that you all know, but I just wanted to, to, to set the picture. We've had a huge toll, and, and as we saw from earlier slides this afternoon, it's still a huge uh, challenge in terms of an infectious disease. And to date, we've had 75 million people infected, and of those, 35.3 million are living with HIV, and only half of them know that they have HIV. So this has been a modern-day plague, if you like, which has threatened to overwhelm the world. And it's been an ex exceptional disease, which has had an exceptional response. And some of that, I think, has been very positive, and I think some of that has been rightfully criticised, and, and it's not all, all been perfect. Huh? Just to look quickly at South Africa, um, South Africa changed the face of the AIDS epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. They started off with about 25,000 people in 2003 on treatment, but now have more than 2.1 million people, achievement of over 80%. And that was at a time when people said, people in Africa can't tell the time, how on earth can you get them to take medicines regularly? Uh, and so there was, a very, there was a very strong movement at the beginning when HIV treatment became available that these people can't do this. It's a public health challenge that you'll never overcome. And yet South Africa have demonstrated that it's possible. And it's a remarkable achievement. But having said that, there are many challenges that remain both in South Africa and many other countries in the world. And, and they've made such a remarkable strides. But some of the bits that remain to be challenged are not a biomedical challenge. And that's what I wanted to bring out today. Let's look at what some of those challenges are. This is the kind of world we live in. 40 countries have HIV-related travel restrictions. 78 countries criminalize same-sex orientation. Most countries criminalize certain aspects of drug use, sex work. Uh, some people are arrested for having condoms in their pockets. Um, there are ma major problems with law enforcement and harassment and arrests of both sex workers, people who use drugs, but also health workers. Uh, recently in Nigeria, we've had to go in and help our national office with some of the health workers who were either harassed or, or taken into custody as a result of some of their activities in providing services to gay men. So what does that mean in terms of looking at some of these social justice issues when it comes to mounting a health response to a public health issue? Here's another one. Bi are these biological issues? Is this a biomedical response? Or is it a, are these some of the social determinants of disease and some of the structural determinants of disease? And how, as we move forward, can we learn from, from, from the AIDS response what it is to, to address these issues that go well beyond the, the, the health system? And how can we learn from that? So 52% of people living with HIV are women. Two times the incidence of, of uh, HIV in women aged 15 to 24 compared to their male peers. You have the transgenerational sex issue. 35% of female sex workers living with HIV in Western and Central Africa. 
and 19% of transgender women living with HIV. Again, these are snapshots, but they're, they're trying to pull out the fact that it's certain pockets of society and people who are marginalized or criminalized who are sometimes most at risk of HIV but are also carrying the greatest burden. Again, just another few snapshots here, things you probably know, but one in three women experience part, part, intimate partner violence. And 30% of young women are reporting forced sex. And going back to some of the things that James was saying a minute ago, some of the intergovernmental inter discussions that we've seen in the UN recently in the Commission on the Status of Women, the Commission on Population and Development, we're seeing a regression around language on gender. And so in the, in the context of increasing global polarization around the LGBT issue, it's having a negative spin-off in terms of our work with women and girls. And so we're even seeing regression around language, for example, on things like gender-based violence towards young women. And what is that going to mean in terms of our global policy setting and country-level action? Uh, again, another issue is as countries move out of the lower-income bracket, they move into the middle-income bracket, they no longer become eligible for donor funding. The government then manages all the disbursement of, res of resources for the HIV response. So if we don't have any gay men in our country and we don't want to talk about having drug use or sex work, then we don't fund it. And so what are we going to do about that as a global community as we move forward to try and tackle some of these issues? So going back to a, a policy and an advocacy brief for South Africa, this was, again, not to single out South Africa because it's made, a, uh, you know, it's made a tremendous improvement, but, again, just to focus on some of the issues. Sex workers in South Africa face a hostile environment of social exclusion and marginalisation and the violence and, and rights abuses. So going back to, to them, if, if these are the elements that put people at risk of disproportionately high risk of infection and transmission, they also have a, a more limited access to services. The same goes for men who have sex with men and, and people who use drugs in many countries. So in order to bring the AIDS epidemic to an end, we're going to need to reach that 20%. And again, it goes back to setting the targets. If you set a target for health that says universal coverage equals e reaching 80%, it's the 20% that are left over that are those people. And those are the people who can't access because of these social and structural determinants and, cr and criminalization. And so these are the people who are carrying the burden of disease and who are also going to mean that the disease will continue longer term. So, so what are some of the things that we can do to begin to address that? And what have we learned in AIDS that we can, that we can maybe share with others around that? So many of you will be aware of the Bernard Schwarzlander et al. article on the uh, investment framework for AIDS that was produced in the, in the Lancet a couple of years ago. But one of the lessons we've learned from the response to HIV that is that, that to be successful in tackling a very complex epidemic like this, which has multiple social and structural determinants, um, a well-coordinated and well-funded multi-sectoral response is needed. You can't just fix it through the health service. And, and uh, the Lancet Commission is work currently working on um, a, a paper, well, a, 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 a series, a full edition on lessons learned from the AIDS response, which will come out in September. But the UNAIDS, with the Lancet Commission, had this, uh, this whole process. And discussion paper two for the last of the Lancet Commis Commission uh, meetings that was held earlier this year actually tried to document what some of those lessons were that have been learned from the AIDS response about how to manage this. One is the involvement of activists and advocacy, and that's something that's shaped the global health response. The involvement of activists and people demanding care, demanding treatment, de demanding changes in patent law and, ac and redu reduction in the, the cost of medications has been unique in the AIDS response, and it's been, mirroring it's been mirrored now in other diseases, but it has changed the way we work. Again, the idea of, of people living with HIV providing care and being part of, of shaping care policies and delivery. The importance of accurate and localised evidence and, and building on evidence to, to make that advocacy case, packaging that advocacy and that evidence in ways that can be used for advocacy and to direct funding. And I think also increasingly UNAIDS is looking at how that evidence can be much more localised, how we can move in and say it's not just about a country, it's about a particular district in that country. And actually, if you look, it's not just about a district in that country, it's about certain, certain places, certain hotspots. And, and, and again, just a flag there, the, the, the scientific amongst us want to have a very, um, uh, what do you say, numbers approach to this. You know, we want to say, oh, if you go down to that park there, that's where all the needle exchange is happening. You can even do GPS mapping and see where it all is happening, and you can come in with your needle exchange program. But you've got to remember the human rights because the police van is parked around the corner. And so we've got to be careful that some of our biomedical approaches to zoom in on where the activity is happening with our prevention messaging and our prevention services doesn't actually put people at more risk. Um, so, so again, that, that, uh, that importance of both data but respect of human rights. 
The multi-sectoral partnership, again, which as, as uh, uh, Dr. Smith was referring to earlier, led to the creation of the Global Fund for TB, AIDS and Malaria, and the political leadership at the highest level, including member state declarations. And again, the first declaration, that the, the first high-level meeting on a disease was on AIDS in 2001, and that led to a significant change. And the final one is money. There's been a massive injection of money into the AIDS response, and we're not going to see that again, and it's not going to come into other diseases in such a way. But what can we learn from that in terms of now, how do we invest sustainably in, in the AIDS response, but in other things? And I think the big piece from this slide is to say that these are the basic programmatic activities that you see in the middle. But the, the critical enablers which surround that are things like creating an enabling policy and legal environment. It's around making sure that there are gender equitable approaches to healthcare. It's around working with healthcare workers to address stigma and discrimination and police so that they don't, address, uh, they don't arrest people with condoms in their pocket. Um, and unless we actually address some of those social and structural determinants, our biomedical approaches won't work. And I think, again, the danger is in a, in a, in a resource-constrained environment when resources are shrinking, and because the World Health o uh, Organization have put out new guidelines which increase the number of people eligible for treatment because we're treating people at a lower CD4 count, your pill bill has gone up. More people are eligible, so of the amount of money you've got available, your pill bill's gone up. So the danger is that people will say, well, this stuff around rights and gender, it's kind of, you know, it's a luxury we can't afford any anymore. We've got to get the pills out through the government health service. And I think what we are saying is that that won't work. And that we've got to say that the, that the critical enablers are critical because they're just that. They are critical. And unless we actually finance both the pill bill and, and, the, and the health facility health services and the community-based responses and the advocacy, only with that multi-sectoral response will, be, will we be successful. This is just a, a very quick, one of the things we have to to do, and I don't think we do in this community, is, is to convince sometimes the governments of the importance of the community response. If they want to do it all in hospitals, again, with the shrinking bill and the increasing number of people to be reached, we've got to use communities, and one of them is their sheer scale. And this is some data just looking at the percentage of services provided in different countries by the faith-based health service providers. In some countries, they're completely ignored because we don't, want to, we don't want to acknowledge that other people are providing these services. We want to be able to say we've all done it ourselves. But actually, unless we start meaningfully engaging some of these groups in our policy and programmatic action, we won't achieve the goals. And so community delivery... It, it has a number of effects. It keeps people on treatment. It gives better outcomes. It increases the number of people tested and in improves retention and treatment outcomes. But we don't have enough data to back this stuff up. And we haven't, we haven't adequately documented what really works in communities. We know it does, but there really isn't enough evidence to back this up and to support these arguments as we move forward. And that's one of the things I'm interested in having discussions with Edinburgh and others about, how we can increase the research into what works at community level. So again, this is just another one that demonstrates the importance of community-based service delivery. And many of you are aware of that. But again, the piece that we're looking at is not just uh, um, having community health workers in, in the community, but also having the communities themselves providing those services. So if you have gay men or sex workers or drug users in a country where it's criminal to be any of those people, they're not going to go to the, to the government clinic. They're not going to go to state-run services, especially if they know that in some countries now the health workers are required to declare the fact that they're a gay man to the authority. So how are we going to manage the Hippocratic Oath and confident, patient confidentiality in that kind of environment? And so are we going to include the networks of gay men and the sex worker organisations in, in actually providing their own services? And are we going to be able to work with governments to enable them to... To, to, to channel some of the HIV testing and ART services through those community groups. I've rabbited on for too long. Have I spoken too long? So I wanted to say that, um, that, that we've, got, we've talked a little bit about, about the sort of broader policy environment. We've talked a little bit about communities delivering services, but the other piece is around what we call these critical enablers. And, and just to, to flag that uh, the, the Global Fund has now instituted this within their new funding model, and there is the opportunity to put in programs to fund cr uh, community system strengthening. And within the investment framework and the Global Fund new funding model, they're framed in slightly different ways, but they're actually basically the same thing. The critical enablers are actually allowing the communities to design, shape, and deliver these, these programs. It's also about the social enablers, which is about, as I was saying, addressing some of these legal and policy environments, about community mobilization to demand treatment, to mobilize people to go and take up services. I was in the global report last week, uh, uh, two days ago, at the World Health Assembly on progress of towards mother to child transmission of HIV. Uh, the, the major problem at the moment is that women are not taking up antenatal care services. They don't go. 
So how are we actually going to get people tested and onto treatment to prevent transmission to their baby if they don't go and take up antenatal services. So how can we actually mobilize communities to do that? So again, I just wanted to show that, that it's not just about the ideology. It's not just about saying that rights are important and we need to respect people's rights. It's not just about saying gender equity is important and we've got to work for gender equity. What does that look like? And what are some of the programs that one can then cost and fund and include in a grant proposal to make sure that some of this work happens? And UNAIDS has worked with other partners on, on a set of seven programs, for example, to support human rights. And these are some of the programs. So working with communities that they can know and demand their rights. Uh, working with, with law reform to make sure that there, there is some pressure on, on governments to, to open up the laws so that people are not criminalised for activities that put them at risk of disease. Working with healthcare workers to make sure that when a woman comes in pregnant, she's not told to abort that child because she's HIV positive and why on earth is she pregnant? not forcibly sterilizing women who are HIV positive. In order to reduce your burden of transmission from HIV positive women to children to zero, the easiest way is to sterilize all the women. So we want to make sure that we don't put policies in place that that then actually lead to people abusing human rights to achieve those goals. So how do you make sure that you've got that balance? So I think that was just to say this is the, this is the context. I've rabbited, I've tried to sort of pack 30 years' worth of learning into 10 minutes. But what then, as we move into the post-2015 development agenda, is that, is that saying to us? We're not going to get uh, all this money poured into AIDS or any other single disease. So what can we learn from that? The first key message, I think, is, is again, that has been mentioned over and over again here, that policy making, funding and programming will follow the policy. And what gets measured, gets funded, gets done. And so actually what goes into the goals the targets and the indicators in the post-2015 agenda actually matters because that will dictate where the funding flows go, where the programmatic activity is, and, and, and then what actually happens. So for any of you who's not, who've not been involved, it's a massively complex process. I don't expect you to look at that and understand it. But, but for anyone who's not been involved, for the whole of the last year, there's, there's been probably the, the biggest global consultation process on just about anything around the post post-2015 development agenda. There's been masses of, of country consultations, thematic consultations, online consultations. But now that has been has moved into a member state negotiation process. And, and the overarching objective of this whole process is the eradication of poverty by 2030. And, and it's hinged around three areas, the, the economic and the social and the environmental. And what we want to see is, is as the open working group, who are member states, move forward, that they actually make a set of decisions that will, will set us up as a global community to be able to address these issues longer term. The, the member states have asked the Secretary General to provide a, a synthesis report which will be released towards this, the, the end of this year and, and that will have three elements. It will, it will reiterate what the important big building blocks are. It will set the sustainable development goals and the financing framework to monitor that and then the accountability mechanism to deliver on the sustainable development agenda. So that's basically the nuts and bolts of what will happen. And last week, uh, I think 10 days ago in New York, the Open Working Group met for their 11th session. And they are, they are looking at a series of 16 focus areas. And it's much, much broader than the MDGs. Uh, so again, I don't know if, if I'm telling you things you already know, but, uh, but health in, in this environment is getting squeezed right down. We'll probably get one health goal rather than several that were related to health in the MDGs. And, and the chairs are seeking consolidation and consensus. And so... What, what in the marketplace, which is much more crowded, um, how are we going to make sure that, that the, the key issues of health um, and the social determinants of health are maintained? There continues to be a lot of uh, divergent views and, and very little consensus. But I just wanted to show you that that's the, the list of 16 that they're looking at, and they want to bring that down. There was talk about them bringing it down to eight, I think, the other day. So they have, at the moment, they're discussing a goal on health. And there's been quite a lot of discussion, again, I don't know if any of you have followed this, between whether that goal should be uh, a goal framed around healthy life for all, or whether the goal should, in fact, be universal health coverage. And that, uh, that at the moment, th this is some of the language that the Open Working Group was discussing last week. But again, I wanted to throw this back to you, because if those of you have not, have not been involved in this, if you get a universal health coverage goal as the overarching goal, you end up really forcing the whole piece into a biomedical approach because it's about health services and it's about reaching people with health services. Whereas if you have a healthy life goal, 
you actually leave scope and, and space for some of this discussion around the critical enablers, around rights, around gender, and around the social and structural determinants. So there's been a lot of back and forth around that. And again, if you're interested, again, in NCDs and in things that have lifestyle I I implications and applications, that's where we need to be lobbying. And although the member states will, at the end of the day, make these decisions, there is opportunity for civil society still in those countries to actually talk with their governments about what these issues are. Uh, and we're very actively involved both in New York with the, with the embassies in New York, but also in Geneva where most of the embassies have their health expertise because the, uh, the missions in New York who are doing the negotiations are often the diplomats and don't have the technical expertise in health. So they're looking to the Geneva missions. So again, there's, there's a, you know, in terms of the lobbying and advocacy strategies that, that James was talking about a minute ago, you need people in countries talking to the Minister of Health in Zimbabwe and in Malawi and in Zambia about what these issues are that he should be bringing up at the table. You need people in Geneva lobbying with the health missions and you need people in New York so that the messages are consistent across the three places and that people are getting that same set of messages from a number of sources and then it begins to sink in. Two minutes, okay, I'm, I'm just about done. So UNAIDS has worked on a discussion document with the 10 co-sponsoring UN agencies of UNAIDS and civil society and has come up with a proposed suggestion as to what the target then under an overarching health goal would be for AIDS. Uh, and that would be um, towards zero new infections, 90%, zero discrimination and zero AIDS-related deaths. And there's a range of indicators uh, that would go with that. And again, just to flag that you know we're putting that up at 90 um, but recognising that unless you get the stigma and discrimination piece right, those 10% of people are going to be the critical people uh, that will miss. But again, unless you get those strong targets in and unless you get the, 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 the discrimination and stigma piece in there, we risk a biomedical response that will we'll lose out on that. And so the, the, the last couple of things to say are that the, the, the AIDS community is also looking at, under those other 16 areas, what pieces have we learned from the global AIDS response where we've already got work going on and, and uh, indicators that have already been used in the field that countries are already reporting on that you can slot in under other areas so that you can get an AIDS piece into the other areas that were likely to come up, such as health, education, youth, gender, equality, and peaceful society. So if you want something on violence against women, for example, you don't necessarily have to plump it into the AIDS, uh, into the health goal, you can put it into the violence one. If you want something around addressing gender e uh, equity, you can put it into the equality one. If you want something around respecting rights, you can get it also into the equality one. So it was, again, looking at multiple strategies to get the, the different pieces of your broad agenda into the pieces that are being pulled together. So finally, uh, specifically on AIDS, uh, what we want to say is that actually ending AIDS is possible in the post-2015 agenda. We can have a series. That's, that's talking not about... And, and it's very important to say this. This is the bit you have to listen to, okay? I rub it on for ages. But it's not when people are born with HIV today, they are going to live for an entire generation with AIDS and HIV. And therefore, it's not about saying we're going to eradicate all the people with HIV. It's about saying we're going to end new transmission. We're going to make sure that everyone living with HIV is on treatment and that we have reduced stigma and discrimination down to zero. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about ending AIDS. And we then have to provide adequate care and support and treatment for those who are living with AIDS. So that's important. But that the post-2015 agenda should include a commitment to that. And that that's important on about leaving no one behind. And, and let's not just have a narrow focus. That inclusive accountability mechanisms should be put in that we can really make sure that this happens. And that by looking at how we've done that in the age response and how we can do it post-2015, that can be a catalyst and an example for some of the other disease communities moving forward. So I'm sorry I've rabbited because I know it's uh, just too much too fast, but thank you for your time and attention.